Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Purang Damang Sangang Namasami I had one idea for what to do if there was a lag in questions. So perhaps while people think of some, um, I might, I might uh, read from a recent interview I have been transcribing. Um, I did this interview with, a, uh, it's not of me, it's an interview I did with a man named Billy Fitzgerald, who uh, I was speaking with Ajahn Amaro a year ago or a few years ago and he spoke about a man who would come to the monastery and uh just had lived this very difficult hit life um gang warfare uh, fighting the ira and had come to the monastery and been um completely kind of converted and saved by it so i did two interviews with him and uh he um was a pretty astounding story. So I might read some from that. This is from Billy Fitzgerald's interview. I was born in Liverpool, England, and I come from a very violent background. Walking down the street, it was gangs. In the house, it was violence, and there were killings. There were two killings before I was a junior. I didn't do it, but the gangs I was involved with did. The gangland, I wasn't suffering from paranoia, but just sheer survival instincts. As a kid, I was stabbed in the head, beaten, dragged across the floor by my hair, and kicked. Religion was part of it, Catholics versus Protestants. I was brought up a Catholic. One part of Liverpool was Protestant and the other was Catholic, and they had statues in the windows showing which they were. If you walked into the wrong part, there was trouble. It was mad, crazy. There were no guns at that time, but there were plenty of knives, axes, and hatchets. Plenty of violence. You couldn't walk down the street without being part of a gang. I was part of armed robberies. Uh, I'm skipping some parts. Was there anyone good? I asked. My Auntie Maggie. She let me know that there were good people in the world. I went to stay with her when my mom was in the hospital, and it was fantastic. There were no gangland stuff. No... I just knew I was safe and secure, and I was so sad when I had to go back to my neighborhood. She was brilliant. She showed me kindness. She looked after me, took me to the circus and to the park. It wasn't like that back home. Back home, there was violence, abuse, and I felt totally out of place. It was horrible. When my mom was very ill, I didn't go to school for the last two years. I was busy looking after my sister, washing, cooking, cleaning, and so on. I loved her and I felt like her dad. Then social services took her off us and that broke my heart. That's when I ran away and joined the army. I was in the army for two years fighting terrorism and it was just madness, absolute madness. I developed PTSD to the point where I was afraid of going out, afraid of walking down the street, afraid of meeting people. Then I got into alcohol and then ended up being prescribed drugs for PTSD. I was around 46. When they took me off the medication for PTSD, my mind exploded with stuff from my childhood, the army, and violence. It was just suicide. What I tell you now is absolutely true. I left the treatment center because they couldn't treat me anymore and went back to Liverpool. And I was having bad withdrawals. In the bedroom where I used to hide with the curtains closed, I had a television and the remote control was on the bed. I moved and switched the television on by accident. And who's standing there but Ajahn Sumedho? I didn't know who he was, but I thought, I'll watch this, because I'd always had this feeling about Buddhism for some reason. The film was called The Buddha Comes to Sussex, and that was it. I wrote the producer, they sent me the address of Amravati, and I phoned them. 
I know now, but I didn't know at the time, but it was Ajahn Amaro who picked up. And I spoke to him and I said, look, I'm agoraphobic and I have bad mental health problems. Can Buddhism help? And he said, sure, come down here and stay. And I skeptically asked how much we don't charge. I said, you're going to help me and you're not going to charge. Yeah. And I said, I just don't believe it. And that was it. Hook, line and sinker. I got one of the lads that worked with me to drive me down, and I stayed there for 10 days on retreat. After about four or five days, my head was racing. I couldn't stop thinking, so I asked the retreat leader, which had happened to be Ajahn Atapemo, to speak with me. He said, okay, and at half past that nine that night, I met him in the hall. He was sitting there, looking very smart, like a leader, and I said to him, excuse me, Bonte, I have these thoughts in my head, and they just won't go. What can I do about them? And he didn't say anything. He just looked straight ahead. I thought he hadn't heard me or didn't understand my accent. So I said it again. Excuse me, Bonte. I have these thoughts. How do I get them out of my head? And he looked at me again, like he was cross, like I was a failure. I thought he was going to ask me to leave the retreat. He looked at me and he said, you have these thoughts and you want to know what to do with them? Yeah. And he said, Tell them to F off. And Billy laughed at this point. He said, tell them to F off. Don't let them overpower you. They're only thoughts. That was it. It was my attitude towards the thoughts that was the problem. That was Ajahn Atapemo. That was 30 seconds. I didn't need psychiatric counseling for five years. He just got to the point. How was the monastery? It was the best thing I did. I read something about Buddhism every day. I always read an hour a day. I had a book called Mindfulness, The Path of the, to the Deathless by Ajahn Sumedho. And in there it talks about obsessive thinking. And that's how my PTSD was hitting me because I was obsessed with the past. I didn't know how many times I've read that book, maybe 50 times. I'm gonna skip a little bit. I started to have faith. That's very Christian terminology, but I started to believe that there was a way out of my misery. I started to believe. I went for a week every month and I bought a camper van and I parked outside the gate. So if accommodation was all booked up, I'd just be in the camper van parked outside. At the monastery, I did a lot of building work with the Sangha. Amravati was in its infancy and it needed a lot of building work. So I'd go down there every week, every month, or sometimes longer. I enjoyed it. They'd tell me if, I need, if it needed maintenance work and things like that. I was meditating every day. I had meditation beads, which I used. To put it politely, I have serious mental health problems. That's a fact. But I was able to cope with them with the help of mindfulness. Did you have a moment of awakening? Yeah, I did. The only way to describe it is that I'd already been to AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. But I only had a spiritual awakening when I went to Amravati in 1988. The teaching meant that there was a way out of the suffering and that everything's not permanent and I'm in control of my own destiny, that there was a way out of the 24 hour, seven day a week suffering. Basically, that's it. The thing I noticed is that whatever the negative emotions say, you do the opposite. If you're angry, learn to forgive. If you're intolerant and you want to go back to someone, get back at someone, learn to tolerate. If you're standing in line at the bus station, you have to be patient, patient, patience, impatience, tolerance, intolerance, forgiveness, non-forgiveness. One side has pain and the other does not. That's what Buddhism was telling me, to practice opposites. All the crap that had been pumped into my head as a kid, all I had to do was practice the opposite. Where there was fear, face it. When I was depressed, lighten up. When my mind was racing, learn to sit down and meditate and so on. There's a terrorist group in the UK that's terrorized and killed friends of mine, and I had a lot of hatred towards them. And what I realized was this. If I had been born in the same environment, in the same area that they were born, I would have been a member of that terrorist group, and the hatred for them left me instantly. It gave me an insight into what metta, loving-kindness, was all about. That hatred inside of me towards that terrorist group 
Any normal person would have said, well, of course you feel that way. But it was horrible to have inside me to feel that. As to passing the message on, I used to take monks down to Liverpool to give talks, and it was all free. I paid for it. No one else paid a penny. I wanted to pass the message on, and I think other people gained and learned a lot. I'd bring Ajahn Atapemo, or the nuns, down, and I'd rent a hotel function room which held about 100 people. I was a self-employed builder. This was the mid-90s. People initially all said the same thing. They thought it was a money scam, but then they saw how humble the monks and nuns were. Okay, I'm going to skip to the end. In 1988, I came in contact with the Sangha and the simplicity of Buddhism. You might be miserable walking into a room, say you're looking for happiness, and the monk would just say, don't try too hard, just practice opposites. It's as simple as that. Misery is optional. Searching for happiness is like being in a bath with a bar of soap. The more you grab at it, the more it just shoots out of your hand. But if you cup it gently, it just happens. So those are some small excerpts from uh, an interview I did once again with Billy Fitzgerald, a former uh, member of the British military and um, in gangs as well, who fought the IRA during the Troubles and uh, emerged with PTSD. And that's the story of his emerging from it and finding faith um especially like the part where he accidentally turns on the television when he's in his hotel room unable to leave because of his fear and it happens to be Ajahn Sumedho on screen so I think now we have time for questions I've been dealing with a lot of anxiety today. Other than telling myself this is what anxiety feels like, I don't know what else to do, Sacha. Yeah, I think... You know, the Buddhist path is divided into three sections. There's sila, morality, samadhi, um, which is unification of mind or concentration, and then panya or wisdom. And uh, when one looks at a mind state as in terms of this is just what it feels like, or it, this is transitory, this will pass, uh, that's looking at it with wisdom. And uh, that is helpful to an extent. It does help us let go. And um, there are different ways of framing a negative mind state with wisdom that can all be helpful. And it's good to move through those ways of looking at it. So you can tell yourself this is what anxiety feels like. It's also helpful to kind of trace back its causes uh, is there something that's happened in the previous day which brought has brought it up? Um, is there a physical correlate such as perhaps you're hungry and there's a sense of kind of gnawing in the belly? Sometimes hunger can feel a great deal like fear. Did you sleep enough? And sometimes just knowing the causes actually really help feel make you feel like it's okay. Um, it's a way of avoiding shooting yourself with a second arrow, the sense like it shouldn't be this way. However, that final aspect of the path, wisdom, is supported by the first two aspects of the path of sila, morality, and samadhi, or unification of mind. And a different way of looking at these is sila is your external action, um, brightening the heart through external action. Samadhi is brightening the heart through internal development of uh, mind states, uh, increasing emotional well-being. Um, and then wisdom is where you kind of see all these things as transitory. And if what you're doing is just 
looking through various mind states um, and seeing them as transitory or just telling yourself this is how it is, you're relying completely on wisdom to loosen your grip on them. But you haven't, but unless you've cultivated a bright sense of heart through those first two aspects of the path, sila and samadhi, then even if you resist or, or let go a little bit of these negative mind states or don't identify with them, you know, for example, by telling you this is how it feels, uh, it can only go so far because there's, you know, no brightness in the heart to hold you. Another way of thinking of it is we grasp to something no matter what, a mind state, etc. And if you haven't cultivated a bright heart to grasp to in place of this negative mind state, this anxiety, then even though it is rife with suffering, the mind will continue to grasp to the anxiety. And this is one big issue with, um, say, you know, people uh, taking, you know, irresponsible um, psychedelic trips is it can rip apart the ego. But if there's not those first two aspects of the path in place and developed, then there's nothing to hold one. It's also the issue of depression is sometimes depression comes from genuinely seeing the shallowness of one's goals or the fragility of one's life. But unless those first two aspects of the path of this harmony with the external world and harmony with the internal world, sila, samadhi, morality, unification of mind has been developed, then there's nothing to hold one, even as the veil is seen through with wisdom. So all that to say that, um, you know, in a situation like this, you might really have to um, acknowledge that there's only so far wisdom can take you with that mind state and do your best to work with those first two aspects of the path, sila and samadhi. So in this context, maybe that means doing something towards the external world, um, an external action just to brighten the mind. So go for a run, take a cold shower. I recommend cold showers a lot, but they really do make you feel good. Um, perhaps just take a little bit of a nap, call someone you need to call, uh, you know, give something, um, do something, do what you need to do, uh, to, you know, sometimes just telling yourself something is not enough. You actually have to take an action to brighten the mind. And similarly with Samadhi, you know, maybe um, you can really try to cultivate a bright mind state to replace it, such as, you know, reciting a, a mantra of uh, loving kindness or just meditating for a time. So, yeah, I think uh, you have to find skillful means for anxiety. And, um, yeah, if wisdom isn't doing it, sometimes you have to brighten the mind through other means. Um, but all within that overarching uh, framework of wisdom, where you see that this is just how it is sometimes. And even as we progress along the path, our trajectories like this, it dips and then it goes up a little more and then it dips and then it goes up a little more. And we're constantly encountering the same patterns again, that samsara. But in the Christian conception, there's the concept of a spiral staircase where, yes, samsara circles you around to the same mind states again and again. But each time you encounter it, if you're practicing, your trajectory and your state of mind is a little bit better. And you're working with that same hindrance, that same obstacle at a slightly more refined level. And so you shouldn't assume you're in the exact same place. Just noticing the anxiety is a big deal. Um, and this is a great gift, this spiral staircase, because if we were forced to confront these uh, hindrances and abandon them all in one go, we wouldn't have the strength of heart to do it. And just to expand on that image, because it's beautiful, in the Christian conception, the spiral staircase goes down towards purity of heart and at the same time up towards purity of love. And I think there's something about the four noble truths there. Even as we humble ourselves and touch our suffering and become pure and pure in our heart, and you can see it on people's face, 
um, through that first noble truth, the third noble truth develops and we touch more and more peace and move towards purity of love. So it's not a perfect overlay, but I like it. How does one deal with feelings of stagnation? Is it a common experience for monastics? Oh yeah, <laughs> yes it is. Um, I think this is what kills a lot of monastics actually. In Freudian psychology, there's two basic instincts in the heart. And actually, I think Freud may have um, gleaned these from Buddhist thought through some of his predecessors who were explicitly influenced by Buddhism. But they are the life instinct of Eros, which is the instinct to create, to give, to become. It's bhava tanha. But there can be health, health, healthy bhava tanha, craving to become. And then there's the death instinct or thanatos, which is like vibhava tanha or the craving for annihilation, the craving not to become in Buddhist terminology. And that's the instinct to hurt, to injure, to kill. And because it's not expressed externally, it gets expressed internally as the superego in Freudian thought. So that's the part of you that berates yourself for not being good enough. It's all the aggression turned inwards. And one issue with practice is, you know, if you're just sitting and trying to direct the mind through act of will and trying to renounce this and that, it's as if you're, it's just, it can be a lot of that momentum towards, it's not exactly the death instinct, but it can become threaded with that. Um, and and not, not that meditation and renunciation are always threaded with vibhava tanha, with death instinct, but just to say that I find in the practice, people really need to look more towards eros or the life instinct to create, to give, to um, brighten the heart. And that I find is how uh, stagnation can be fended off. So some really skillful means that are fairly dharmic for doing that um, is having some means of art. So writing a bit during the day, um, painting a little bit, uh, if you're a creative type. Um, and also uh, just feeling like you're growing in something. It's, it's bhava tanha, it's uh, craving to become, but it's in a wholesome direction. So bringing into your practice a uh, period every day where you memorize the suttas. If you haven't memorized the discourse on the turning uh, of the wheel of Dhamma, the Dhamma Chaka Bhavatana Sutta. That's a good place to start. Bhikkhu Bodhi has said it's the most profound words ever uttered by a human being. And I think that's accurate. Um, so if you're going to memorize anything, it might, might as well be that. So to do that, to give, to um, find ways of, because stagnation has a sense of, if you're not expressing and giving voice to uh, an internal energy, then sometimes it blocks up itself and blocks the wellspring from which it comes. So it can be important in practice to find new roots for those internal energies because you're cutting off a lot of ones you formerly use because they're not wholesome. You know, maybe you're not going out to clubs as much. So there's not that same, I don't know, uh, venue of dancing and expression. So can you write poetry a bit or um, find some other means of expressing that, that part of your heart? Um, so I find that really does help with stagnation is uh, finding a means of expressing and growing in Dhamma. And I think memorization, art, giving are all healthy ways of doing that. In America, I've always felt a duty to educate myself of the horrors of human nature, to analyze the failures of man and know them. So when the day came, the bell of warning could be rung. The older I've gotten and the further I've gotten into study, I've lost faith that that rationality can stop the inevitable rise of ignorance in the world. 
the point where there is no turning back when brothers draw arms and shed blood among the fields where blood has been before. How do we turn away from this activity? How do we lay down the sense of necessity towards our obligations for country and our fellow man and leave it for what it is? The triple gem is the only true path, but it is difficult to leave behind the hopes and dreams we've been raised to before contact with the Dhamma. First, I'd say it's helpful to know how dark the world can be, even if you acknowledge that that darkness comes from ignorance and have compassion for those who are trapped in it, because we all are to some extent. As to setting aside those aspirations to change um, the world or make it right, uh, I'd say we don't have to set those aside. What we have to do is give up any idea that self-righteous anger or anger is ever a valid means towards affecting change. As practitioners, we never get to believe that anger is justified. And Yet, the power of action done from love is still, is much more significant. You think of those figures that have remained with us in our historical memory, who we think of when we think of the people we want to emulate, and it's those who have affected change from love. You know, Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela, the Dalai Lama. And so, you know, and, and to an extent, it's something about the difference between a protest and a vigil. Um, although that's an imperfect distinction, there's time for protests. But the energy of, of love um, is, is a real thing. And so we can... Um, interact with the world and its troubles, but we do so from a different place. And a really good feel for how to balance that is if you feel yourself um, unable to hold your center um, when you get involved in these issues, if anger and unwholesome states are coming into being in your mind, then you need to pull back and establish your center or find a different route of affecting change that does not do that to you. Because as practitioners, our highest priority is always taking care of our heart as much as we're able. In Buddhism, there's no difference between ends and means. The ends, the means are the ends and the ends are the means. So if you find you're trying to affect some change and your mind is getting hot, bothered, and beginning to polarize um, the world, then you need to pay attention to that. Um, Ajahn Amaro speaks about how practice is a bit like um, balancing our interaction with the world with our seclusions, a bit like sharpening a, sharpening a knife. If the angle's too sharp, um, if we're having too much interaction with the world, um, the edge breaks off. If the angle's too shallow, if we're just sort of resting in seclusion and not encountering the world and developing wisdom by interacting with it, then the knife never gets sharp. You have to find just the right angle. So, uh, yes, and, and then, you know, in every Buddhist list, there is always a representative of wisdom. So even if our lives are guided by the Brahma Viharas, the boundless abodes of loving kindness, of compassion, of rejoicing, which they should be, if you can guide your life from those, that center, um, you have to remember that the Buddha always did put equanimity in there, equipoise. Because there's times when you need to step back and acknowledge that you can't affect change in this specific instance. Um, and, and there's a place for that. It's madness to think that, you know, to try to affect things you can't. And it's better to save your energy for something else. And as a practical means of approaching this, uh, Long Proposano really recommends pulling back on how much news you take in. Because um, you don't need to check, you know, that sort of... Um, 
throwaway phrase of I want to be informed. It's such a unexamined phrase. Like how, how many times do you have to check the smartphone every day to be informed really in a way that actually could help you affect change. So uh, much better is to, uh, in the words of Long Propasano, pick one issue you can actually make a difference on and that'll frequently be local and really become well-versed in that. And then as to all the other stuff that you can't actually do that much about, take a big step back, you know, um, maybe read some long form articles once a week or once a two weeks, or just rely on your friends to tell you what's going on. But, um, but it damages people's minds more than they think. And uh, for no real benefit, if, if there's not an examined purpose to it. Um, I'm going to post a great website which I just got recommended by a bunch of uh, a Buddhist called coronavirus.org, which has good news from the world. I think it's a good counterbalance to uh, everything else. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Rick, I live in continual physical pain due to life-altering illness. How do I seek refuge in the triple gem instead of seeking comfort and freedom from pain from food, diet, soft drinks, or watching TV? First, my consolations on the illness. A chronic pain is something very real that I've never had to deal with. So I, I don't know how, um, you know, how much I can speak to your experience. I'd say that one helpful thing is um, acknowledging the limits of just meditation. Um, you know, uh, in the list of the spiritual perfections or paramitas, laid down in the canon. Um, there's a huge number. There's 10. Um, there's giving, morality, renunciation, energy, uh, uh, patience, truth, determination, loving kindness, equanimity, uh, concentration as well earlier. So, so often, you know, we just, as Westerners and modern people, we love the teachings about with, um, wisdom and meditation. And that is usually what gets us into the practice. But so often we forget those, those other very basic grounding uh, paramitas or perfections, such as giving, dana. Um, and that's the first of all those paramitas. It's such a basis. And so if just acknowledging that as part of your practice, um, so if you can find ways to give uh, in little and, and big ways, you know, maybe your experience with pain is something that would actually let you um, involve yourself a bit with hospice or something, someone who's hurt. But there, if you can find some way of um, supplementing the formal practice of meditation with these other means of brightening the mind in a particular way for you, then that's significant and can be very sustaining. And, uh, and otherwise, I think, you know, looking at um, ritual, uh, as Ajahn Pasano says, the props are important. So, you know, um, creating a shrine, bowing to it regularly, uh, you know, doing chanting, um, sometimes when pain is powerful, uh, just sitting meditation and following the breath is not enough. And so there's can be real benefit in um, giving your practice a trellis on which it can grow and these the form is a trellis so the shrine the bowing the chanting taking one day a week as your sabbath day to practice listening to the dhamma if you can make it to a monastery despite your illness that's really really useful so try that too and then if you have some other way of um, involving yourself with kali and amitta spiritual friends as you're doing now then that's great but um yeah, I, I think it's 
something I can only speak so much to. Um, being in that situation is not easy. Um, so my best of luck, best of luck to you. And um, if you want people to, if you ever could use a bit of support from others um, on Clear Mountain's website, we have a page called the Blessing Braid, where if you put your name down, everyone on the Blessing Braid will spread loving kindness um, to you. So it can be helpful. Okay, good. So I think uh, we do have a little longer, but I don't want to push the time too much because we have a Zoom session now. So for those who are interested, um, feel free to uh, join the um, Zoom session, which we have from 6.45 to 7.30. I'm going to find the uh, link. The link is, if you don't see it here, on our web page, on the front page. And you just click on that link, and I'm going to post it now, too. Um, yeah, and we just talk for a while. So uh, I hope everyone has a great Thanksgiving. And um, don't go too wild on Black Friday, uh, which I hear is when people go shopping and such. <laughs> but uh it's always a pleasure to see everyone and um, take care. Here's the Zoom link.